welcome friends to this monthly meeting which we have here in order to keep on track on our spiritual path we live our worldly life and we also live our spiritual life worldly life is what we do outside of our own body our own self spiritual life is what we do inside inside our body people practice contemplation wondering what is happening in the body some are interested in the whole body inside the six energy centers and some are more interested in the centers of awareness which lies behind the eyes and above the eyes there is no conflict between the two i have received more than one letter from people saying how can we put the two together because if we are putting our attention spirituality outside work is a distraction and if we are being distracted how can we do that why should it be a distraction if we are doing two different things we do do different things people work in an office and they also sit at home and eat their dinner there is no distraction that's work done some other place this is work done at home so there is no real distraction you can do your worldly work as effectively with as much attention as you can give and still do your inner work as attentively with as much attention as you can give there no real conflict don't mix them up just because they say don't have a distraction the word distraction is not meant for outside work distraction means distracting yourself with spirituality when you're doing outside work and distracting yourself with outside work when you're doing inside work distraction is to bring something not suited for that particular activity you are doing therefore there is no real conflict lord krishna when he was describing the law of action he said we must do action to be a good yogi he says yoga karma su kaushalam that means if you have to perform action in this world do it with the best skill you have your skill should be the best skill you can use to do your worldly work you have to raise a family do your best you have to work in an office work in a business work anywhere do your best use your best skill the only thing is don't mix up the two don't bring your work into your spiritual thoughts and don't bring spiritual thoughts into your work do them as two separate things we have been given a human body which can work by the way now i must inter- inter- interrupt and say i told you in november that at age 92 i just turned 92 in november i got a new job today morning i was attending another meeting of another company board of directors and the chairman hinted to me they may give me another job in this company also to get two jobs at 92 I congratulated myself. Do you also congratulate me? Very happy that I could share this good information. I never imagined in my whole life I could get not one job but two jobs at this age. But I'll do a good job like I'm explaining to you. It will not interfere with my internal practice of meditation when that is done all the attention is there when the job is done all the attention is there we have power control over our attention where we place our attention so therefore this question that oh we have to leave the whole world and we have to give up everything in order to be spiritual is totally wrong people who have tried it 
And I met many people like that. Oh, we, this world is too much of a distraction. It is something not real. And we are running away. Running away where? We are going to a particular ashram in the mountains. That's the place to meditate. We are going to the forest. We are going to retreats. We are going far away. I said, are those retreats made of the same matter that this world is made of or is it made of different? Is that forest made of some other kind of material? That this world, if this is unreal, that must also be unreal. Moreover, I have met swamis, yogis, sitting in the mountains. I just ha happened to get a chance to work in those mountains as part of my job. And I remember meeting so many of them. And all of them are thinking about what they have left behind. They have not really renounced anything. It cannot. The mind does not renounce. The mind holds on more. I am telling you, if you tell the mind, don't think of that, it will think much more of that. You remember the story I told of an American seeker who was looking for shortcuts on a spiritual path. And he heard a great Swami, great yogi living in the Himalayan mountains in a cave gives you a special mantra. And if you repeat the mantra, you get enlightened. Nothing could be better shortcut than that. So this man traveled all the way, took a lot of pains to travel to India, traveled up the mountains, had to walk quite a bit to reach that cave. And when he reached there, the Swami was inside the cave. And five, six disciples were sitting outside. He also sat with them. When the Swami emerged, he folded his hand, said, Swamiji, I have come from the United States. I understand you have a very special mantra, special words. If we repeat, we get enlightened. He said, yes, I have. Swamiji, will you give me those words? Of course, you have come from a long distance, I'll give you. So he approached the Swami and Swami said, come close to me. And he whispered in his ear, the secret words are abracadabra. He said, what, I've come all this distance just to hear abracadabra? The Swami said, no, no, there's something more to it. When you say abracadabra, at that time, do not think of bananas. The man tried all his life. Abracadabra, bananas would come in front of him. When he decided not to think of bananas, bananas wouldn't go away. This is true for all of us. When we try to say, I don't want to think of this, you will think of it all the time. The mind works like that. People who run away from the world, they are thinking of the world all the time. They can't do it. Nature of the mind. Therefore, you don't have to run anywhere. Just control what is within your control, your attention. You know where to put your attention. Read a book, all your attention on the book, and you understand it much better. Attention is scattered, you're thinking of something else, trying to read a book, you read the same page over and over again. Doesn't make sense. Attention is the secret. Concentration of attention is the secret. Concentrate your attention on the physical work you have to do, the physical outside work outside of your body you have to do and do the best you can. Concentrate your attention inside as best as you can. No other thought except what is happening inside. Think of nothing else what's happening inside. Use your mind. Use your imagination. Use all your faculties to concentrate on what's happening inside imaginary or real, but all the attention, what is happening behind my eyes inside? No conflict. You will succeed in both. You will succeed in the world and you will succeed in the meditation and your spirituality. So this is a very interesting thing. I just wanted to bring it to you because people write to me that how can we balance the two things? How can we balance worldly activity and our spiritual life. If there was a conflict, then you have to balance. There is no conflict at all. But 
Lord Krishna says, if you want to be a yogi with action, action should be performed with the utmost skill. But the second part is, do not expect any fruit from that. Whatever fruit comes, accept what comes. If you start thinking of the fruit, then that action cannot make you a yogi, cannot give you any benefit spiritually. But if your action is based upon your skill and no calculation of what am I getting out of it, then you can become a yogi. Both these things can be done. You can be practicing yoga of action, karma yoga, and you can be practicing yoga of sankhya yoga, of discovering what's inside your mind. You can be a yogi, a real yogi, performing the highest yoga known to yogis, bhakti yoga, yoga of love and devotion, both outside and inside. That's one yoga that can be practiced both outside and inside. That is why these gurus appear in our life. A guru, when he appears in our life and we accept him as guru, Guru, that means remover of darkness. If he can remove the darkness of our own, ignorance of our own self, and we find and he pulls us with his love, we have such an easy may, way of, of practicing love and devotion, both outside and inside. Outside, physically beating that person and expressing your love and devotion. Inside, by remembering that person, manifesting him inside and expressing your love and devotion. Bhakti yoga is the highest yoga. In describing the three yogas, even Lord Krishna, whom I'm remembering again, he says, karma yoga, everybody can do. It yields a result because you're not expecting a result, therefore you're controlling your mind. Sankhya yoga or Gyan yoga is where you discover the limits of your mind that thoughts cannot take you beyond a certain point. Therefore, your mind becomes under control. It's not worth it to use the mind for any further knowledge. And Bhakti Yoga is the highest, according to Krishna, the highest that takes you beyond the mind. So that is why we have the opportunity to practice all these all the time. And there is no conflict between them. You can, if you practice like this, very efficiently doing your work in life, efficiently practicing meditation inside, performing actions according to your skills and not expecting a result, meditating with your mind and performing the best yoga of love and devotion for a guru. What else do you want? It'll, it'll work. I guarantee. Do these three, it'll work. Now that's what I wanted to clear that there is no conflict, and please follow it. You see an envelope in my hand. This is not a letter of appointment. I thought it is. It is a joke sent by my friend Rishi. He sends these jokes by email to me every day, and that makes my day, I laugh all day. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. I should have put it off earlier. One more. <laughs> he said some nice jokes once. When I tried to read them, I saw some words and I said, not good for children, so I put it down. Then he has sent a large number of jokes and said they are certified to be clean. That packet of jokes he sent at the holiday time, but unfortunately was not delivered to me. It remained in the hands of the person to whom it was handed and she forgot to hand over to me. So they have been handed to me only this morning. And although it is certified, these are all 100% clean jokes. It's so recorded there. And also, that's been verified by a second person who's also tested. 
I am not reading them because I have to read myself. Because I find some people tell jokes, there's a clean one, and I have to shut my ears. So the definition of clean can be different. But what is in my hand today is for today, is brought by him today, and that's a clean joke. So if you don't mind, can I read it? A short one. When a man opens the car door for his wife, it means one of two things. It's either a new car or a new wife. Thank you. Thank you. It uh, brings up the issue of our relationships, cars and wives. <laughs> cars are good for transportation. Wives are good for paying off karma. Some people say to me, I want to have an accelerated payoff of the karma. I don't want to be here too long. I advise marry. <laughs> when people marry, they expect something very different. They expect they are going to be with a person who thinks like them, has the same values, they will be together. It takes not too long a time when you discover no two person exist with the same values and with the ideas. And if you meet once in a while, like friends, you don't discover these differences. If you live together every day, you discover the differences. And we, when we marry, are not prepared for those compromises on both sides, which are required to say, Let's see the common ground between us and live on that, not on the differences. We try to live on the differences and assert our differences. Therefore, arguments and fights start all the time. I have seen many marriages like that. Is it the marriage, the institution of marriage that does it? Or is it just getting together can do it? There was a couple I met in Nevada once, in the 60s, when I first came to this country. Emily and Charles, I remember their names. Emily and Charles fell in love. So much in love, they sh were sure they are soulmates. They enjoyed meeting, enjoyed telephone conversations. Then they got married. And for a couple of weeks, nice honeymoon. Then they began to argue. Then they began to fight. Then the fight went to a point they had to separate and divorce. After Emily and Charles divorced, they fell in love again. They missed each other. And they said, we miss each other. We made a big mistake. We should never have been separate. We are soulmates. And they became soulmates again. They remarried. Same couple. Within two weeks, the differences came up. Arguments started. And very quickly, they were divorced. Second time. After second divorce, they still missed each other. The good things all started coming back again. And they married a third time. Same couple. After marriage, after two, two weeks, arguments started. In a few months, they were in divorce court again, divorced third time. I have not heard too many cases like that. But they were my friends. I knew both of them very well. And I saw exactly when I studied like a case study. How does it happen that when they're not married, they are happy together. And when they married, something happens. What happens with this institution called marriage? What does it do to our mind that we become different when we get married? And I discovered 
that when you get married, you begin to take the other person for granted. It does not happen if you're not married. This business of both parties taking the other person for granted, and therefore you can assert your point of view better than the other, leads to conflict. In every case of marriage, I've been studying then after that, including my own. I'm not exempting myself from it. That is exactly what happens. And the, if you know about this, I still want to marry. <coughs> then remember, when you have the arguments, you are paying off old karma. Then feel very happy. Let's have a few more arguments. <laughs> I used to remember there's a town in Pakistan called Lahore. In the main city, <clears throat> people lived in high floors. And they were alone, so the elderly ladies, men used to go to work, elderly ladies didn't know how to spend time. I still remember one lady was very keen to have some argument. So she would call up on the neighbor at the door floor, let's not let's have a chat. He would say, let's have an argument. Let's have a fight. Sister come and let's fight. And they would, she would say, why would I fight? My shoe will fight. And the fight would start and they enjoyed that for an hour or so. I couldn't believe it. I was a witness to this. I couldn't believe that they are enjoying a fight, but I think they were enlightened people. <laughs> if we are enlightened, we should do the same thing. If we get married, we should take advantage of the accelerated karma we are paying off. Enjoy how we are paying off the karma. Enjoy how wonderful this opportunity has come to us to pay off karma. And fight with the mouth outside but inside, smile. Inside where you meditate, third eye center. Sit there and smile and watch the show. I have suggested many times that if you want to make progress in this world, spend more time inside. Not only in meditation. Meditation is just a technique, a method of concentrating your attention and finding out that uh, you have a self more real, more capable of doing things inside, sitting inside, than you have in the physical body. A physical body is the outermost cover of your own self. But the other reason why I say is that watch life itself from that vantage point. Imagine, it's all imaginary exercise, but works. Imagine you have a very comfortable chair and you close your eyes, the chair is right in the center, and you can relax on it. You relax when you open your eyes. Don't think that you are not there anymore. Open your eyes, stay in the chair, look at the world. Wow, wonderful. Now I've opened the eyes of my outer body, and I'm looking at the world, I'm still in the chair. Wow, so many nice characters out here working. And one so close to me, my own body. That's the closest character. I'm sitting in the head of the one character. And then all the other characters are there. If you start watching the show from there, you'll be the happiest person in this world. Just don't give up. Don't become the same person, just an actor. Become the one who is watching the act. And it can be done. It's a practice. It's just a practice to constantly feel, day and night, constantly feel that you are watching a show from a vantage point that you have of sitting behind the eyes in the wakeful state and seeing what is going on in this world. You are participating in the world. The, your own body is an actor participating in the world like others. You're no different from others. Not that others are unreal, you are real. That much is more real, what you watch, what is, who is watching is more real than your own body and all other bodies that you watch. So when you practice 
sitting behind the eyes and you watch you are really practicing meditation while working every day you are practicing meditation while you are awake you can do your meditation all the time just by practicing to not do something special imagine is just use of imagination the imagination pulls your attention nothing pulls attention faster than imagining if i imagining i'm sitting on top of this building my attention goes there i imagining i am in the himalayan mountains right now attention goes there attention moves fast with imagination so when you imagine you're sitting behind the eyes your attention is pulled there and you become a witness to the world and not a participant your body becomes a participant and you become a witness to the world i am mentioning these things because it again resolves that same conflict of outside and inside a one statement i once read which said antar bahar eko jano yahi guru gyan bataya the guru has told me that inside and outside are the same for a time it took me time to see how can they be the same till i discovered how the outside is created outside is created from the inside and inside has the original copy of what you see outside they are both there at the same time it's not that outside is creation is different and you are just watching it the point from where you are watching behind that point is the area from where the outside is being projected it's almost like going to a movie theater when you go to a movie theater you are sitting in a comfortable chair the action is taking place on a screen in front there is nothing on the screen there is nobody there what you are seeing there is coming from behind you not in front of you is coming from projector we never notice the projector we don't go to see the projector we are not even conscious of the projector when we go to see a movie we are only interested in watching what is happening on the screen but if one were to say why is it happening how is it happening how real is it then we can say yes there is a projector already having the film in it and what will happen there has already happened it's already loaded there there we are waiting now what will happen next will that person do that or not these thoughts are coming to us after seeing the shadows of what is happening in front we are taking it real because we are not putting any attention that what is going to happen has already happened it's already happened in the projectors behind us and projector is nothing but a pre prepared predetermined drama acted by people long ago who were not real at all they were just acting they even this is not a real story even it's just an acted story and actor acting was done and a movie was prepared movie is being put in a projector a light is throwing a shadow on the screen and we are sitting there watching oh, what is going to happen now and we laugh when good things happen we cry when we are in the movie we get frightened in scary movies we are taking it as real there is no difference between that and what we are doing right now looking at the world the world was drawn up completely the whole picture was completely made up much earlier before we ever came here and it's all a multi dimensional screen around us through which we are seeing the light of the consciousness of the soul is projecting to the mind in which the images are loaded and we are seeing the world there's no difference whatsoever but we taking it as real like we take the movie as real this we take even more real because of one difference in the movie and this movie that in the movie in the hall we are not sitting in the screen we are sitting away from it here we have decided to go further close to the action and they decided not to sit in an audience outside but to sit in one of the characters 
and that character we think is ourself. And the whole burden of the ups and downs of the movie is falling upon us by this one mistake, that we are real and this world is real, and therefore we have to go through what is going on. At least we can pull out ourselves from this by the exercises suggested. Sit behind the eyes, watch the movie, and never forget that the character in whose head you are sitting is just a character, like any other character. It's not yourself. Never was. It's part of the movie. It's a projection outside. You are even creating your body from outside. It's very interesting that we have been saying from the beginning that the world is created from within consciousness. Consciousness is the power that creates. Consciousness is a power, whatever it becomes conscious of, becomes creation. Consciousness exists as a creative power because conscious. It cannot exist if there is nothing to be conscious of. Therefore, at all times, whatever is conscious of, that power of consciousness becomes creation. It creates layers of creations. It can create covers upon itself and still keep on creating more. These are just three basic covers that's created. It, has, it can cover many other, it can create many other covers. These basic covers are upon our consciousness. First cover, mind. What is mind? Mind is a very beautiful organic computer. It's organic because it's made of organs. The mind is a thinking machine. Very good machine. One of the finest I've seen. I have not seen a better machine anywhere in this world than the machine we all carry in our head called the human mind. The human mind can create space and time, very big thing. To be able to create space and time, very big thing. Human mind creates space and time. It also creates events. It creates a script for a whole drama to take place. The mind has the power to imagine. When it imagines, it creates. When it imagines, without being covered by anything else, it's very wonderful, high-powered creation, high-powered imagination. And everything is created outside of the mind, starting with the mind itself surrounding consciousness. So consciousness is responsible for the mind to function, because you're being conscious of time and space through the mind. But it's still a cover upon the consciousness. The consciousness is conscious of itself at all times. Never forgets. Never. Therefore, consciousness, which pre-exists before mind creates time and space, is the only immortal thing. Because there was no time and space, it has to be immortal. There is no birth and death if there is no time. Time is created by a cover upon consciousness. And that is why it's a beautiful cover, wonderful, with great capability, capable of creating time, space, cause and effect, events, drama. And when it creates time and space, it places with its imagination events upon that based upon a drama a script, which we call our destinies now. Though so destinies are manufactured right there. And it experiences those wonderful destinies as it likes. It goes into the past what it has created. The future, unlimited future, unlimited past. It enjoys. Consciousness enjoys the functioning of the mind and runs all over through unlimited space, unlimited infinite time, infinite space. Such a beautiful stage it has set for itself and enjoys it. And then, whatever it enjoys, it perceives, it experiences. First time, with one little machine, we create something we call experience. 
before the mind is there, there is no such thing as experience. Experience is, the word experience is designed for explaining something that exists in time. Therefore, only when time is there, we can have experience. Consciousness per se is consciousness, not experience. Consciousness generates something which gives us experience. Experience of what? Of everything. Unlimited. There's no limit to it. That machine can create anything. We have unlimited experience and we enjoy it. The experience that consciousness has, sometimes we call it perception because we perceive what we are experiencing. Consciousness picks it up, what's experiencing. Perception of the experience, great experience. We cover ourselves with one more layer of something very beautiful, most beautiful thing, and that what we call is our sense perceptions, astral body. Mind has been called the causal body. Just to explain that we are covered with three bodies and we are explaining it in the physical body. Therefore, we are calling them bodies. The mind is the causal body. There is no body as such. It's the mind that appears to be the body around consciousness. Sense perceptions are the astral body. Sense perceptions are nothing more than the division of perception into different types of perception that seeing becomes different from hearing. It need not be different. Both can be experienced simultaneously. All the five senses of perception become broken into five parts of the total perception of the mind in order to enhance our experience. The experiences we are generating in time and space get enhanced by the fact that we put on another beautiful cover that helps us to now to see things differently, hear differently, smell differently, touch differently. What a wonderful experience of the created events on time and space. And then we add finally, as we are sitting here today, we added one more level, matter, physical matter, atoms and molecules to this whole complex and it's called a physical body. The physical body is shaped after the astral body, after the sense perceptions, how we have placed them around ourselves. And therefore, we place the eyes to see on the top of the body, and not on the belly, not on the feet, not on somewhere else. We place them as close as possible to where we are operating as a mind, where we are operating as a consciousness, as a soul. We placed it very close so we could see from close where we are, not from a distance in the form that we have taken. We place the listening capacity, ears, right here, very close, not in our hands and feet. We place the nose so close for smell, place the mouth so close for taste, and allowed the whole tactical system of touch to appear all over the body. Great job done. Imagine these three covers upon consciousness are generating the most beautiful experiences we can ever have. Experiences with a, such a variety of ups and downs that even imagination is defined how we can create so much. And all this creative drama that we can watch for which we have created lies right now in a created universe outside of ourselves, outside of the consciousness which is watching and experiencing it now. Can't you imagine this great miracle that you have of observing a creation is being wasted by us by thinking we are the characters in that? We created the characters for the show. How did we become the characters? just because we wanted the drama should appear to consciousness as real as possible. Why is this reality so much needed? Why do we have to make it so real that we get caught up and forget who we are 
We forget we are consciousness. We forget that the mind is merely an instrument we are using. We forget the sense perceptions were merely to enhance the experience. And we become what names we have given to characters, including this character in which we are sitting in the head. How did this mistake happen? Isn't it worthwhile to get to know all these things at least? At least get to know what's happening? What is spiritual path except knowing what is happening? There is no other spiritual path. There is no journey anywhere that we have to go. The spiritual path is to be aware of what's happening and get back to watching the show from where it belongs. If you can't watch from consciousness itself, you should be able to. You should be able to see this creation of space and time. You can. If you were to withdraw something already created by us called attention and withdraw attention to your consciousness, you can see the show of the mind. You can see the show of sense perceptions. You can see the show of the physical body. You can see the whole world created. It's just a question of withdrawing attention to where it belongs for you to see the show that has been set up. But there was another need. Need was that like we divided perception into sense perceptions to enhance their value, we decided to make this experience real to enhance its value. The steps taken to make this was very simple. First step, we shut off our own awareness of consciousness. We secondly shut off our own awareness of the mind that operates inside. Third, we shut off all awareness of the astral self that functions as sense perceptions. When we shut off all these, this was the only thing available, became real. Nothing to compare with. If you had not shut off, we would know this is just created. If we think of something now, we know it's just a thought, it's imaginary, because not there, we are aware of the physical one, and imaginary one beyond this is not real. But if we lose this, the imagination becomes strong, dreams come and become real. There's a scientist who has been given great credit today, and he's very controversial. He has just made a statement that the reality we are seeing outside, he's a, he's a professor of physics and medicine, he's a doctor. I can tell you his name, somebody is from China, somebody sent me his article. He has said that biologically, we have created the universe from inside. And he has given all his proof for that, mainly based upon quantum physics, mainly based upon the fact that the quantum, quantum physics is human observation that changes energy into matter, proven over and over again for the last 60 years. Based on that, he has come to the conclusion and he has come up with a theory of creation which he calls biocentrism. You can study some of you. Biocentrism means that the creation of the entire experience is biological from the center, from the brain, which he says is the mind. Even the brain is created by the mind, according to him. And therefore, he says it's a conversion. Whatever observations we have of the quantum physics today, it is that the observation changes waves, energy into matter. Starting from electron, electron, is the outer negative energy on every molecule, on every atom. So many electrons roam around to create matter that we are seeing and experiencing. Where exactly in hydrogen atom, an atom called hydrogen, which is the most basic, the simplest atom, only one electron moves around the nucleus. We know it has an orbit. It moves continuously. If it moves a little further away, it will fly off. If it moves a little closer, it will fall on the nucleus. The whole equilibrium of this universe is based upon keeping particles at the right place in orbit 
so they don't fall, they don't fly away. It's a balance. We know the distance of that electron from the nucleus to keep that balance based upon the studies we have. But is it in an orbit like this, upward and down, orbit like this, orbit like that? There are million opportunities. In 1940s, when I was studying physics in college, at that time they used to describe a hydrogen atom, one dot called the positron or the, the middle portion, the nucleus, and one line was drawn on paper, that's the electron. Modern books say it's like a wave around it. It's, we don't know where it is. It can be anywhere. Now we have a technology which can go to the size of an electron through laser technology. We can put a laser beam at the same distance from the nucleus where the electron is supposed to be. We can put the laser beam this way or that way, this way, anywhere out of the millions of possibilities. Whenever we put the laser there, electron is there. And after that, electron is nowhere else except when we put it. How can that happen? This is quantum physics. This is quantum knowledge today. That the electron was not a particle, not even a negative particle, before we observed it with the laser. It was merely energy. It was merely a wave. And our observation, our intervention, our measurement, our use of a laser made it a particle. Are we converting energy into particles all the time then? Is this, this is the theory that this professor comes up with. He says, if we have, with our observation, able to create the location of an electron, on the basis of which new computers are being designed called quantum computers. Quantum computers are different from the computers we have been using. We are using computers, sorry for my going into a little scientific side. I am very interested in that, so I'm sharing. In regular digital technology which we have been using, the digital language for the computers, we use zero and one. No other, let, no other number is used. Not even zero and one, we actually use only one. If the electric current can pass in circuitry, it's one. If we can protect it, inhibit it, it's zero. That's how we make the circuitry. So actually it's only one digit. The absence of the digit is zero. But zero and one in combinations are creating all the languages we are using creating all the music we are using. Now we are doing 3D printing with the same technology, just with zero and one. Now look at the big advance that is coming. In quantum computers, they will use the quantum knowledge that there is a thing called qubit, not zero or one. A qubit can be one or zero. Depends on how we use it. This is a big, big new thing has come up that we can use qubit. And when a qubit is applied, depending upon the context, it will become zero or one. That means, supposing we are writing a letter now with a quantum computer, we can think and the computer will know what we are thinking and make zeros and one according to what we want to write. Connection between the mind and a machine is being made more intimate. It'll come up in another 10 years, I'm sure you'll be able to see it. So the point he's making is that if human observation can do all this to convert energy into matter, and he says, by all definition in physics, energy is indestructible. Therefore, what you call the creative power, which is energy from inside, is indestructible, immortal. Therefore, there can be no death, and that energy must stay on. Therefore, he's proving even life after death through this theory of biocentrism. You might like to study it. 
somebody told him, what you are talking of, these yogis have been talking of all the time. Have you studied what Zen Buddhism says? Zen Buddhism has been saying it for thousands of years, what you are talking of, that the whole thing is being created from inside. All the great mystics have been saying the same thing. But he will be given different attention. He's a scientist. He's a scientist who works on the scientific principles of empirical knowledge. He's trying to use the empirical knowledge of physics, of outside. Fortunately, in his hands have come the quantum physics has come in his hands and made the same statement that was made by people who put attention inside and saw where all things are being created from. Now, you are all here to know the truth. And I tell you, the truth can be found by anyone. Simple device. Put your attention inside. Explore. Explore what happens. Use imagination. Think this body is just a cover to start with. And place yourself behind the eyes. And see what's happening. The darkness in front of yourself. The ears are on your sides just to listen outside. Eyes have been closed so that you don't identify yourself with the body. Can you still see? Of course. How are you seeing if the eyes are closed? Can you see? Imagine a picture. And the picture comes in front. And are you seeing it? Are you seeing with your eyes closed? And you thought all the time that seeing is coming from the eyes? Eyes are closed. How are you seeing? You are imagining you are up somewhere and you are seeing a different place. How are you seeing it? Who is seeing it? Nobody else except you. There is nobody else there. If you can still see, don't you see that seeing is not connected with the eye? That the eyes are separate from seeing? Can you hear without the ears? Yes, you can. Can you imagine a sound and hear it? Yes, you can. How did you associate that hearing is only from the ears? Can you touch? Yes. If you imagine yourself sitting inside, moving around in the little space in the head, which become big space, because if you forget the body, it become very big space. If you move around in that space, you can do everything. What can you do inside? You are conscious that you are existing, the same that you are conscious outside. You are thinking the same way like you are thinking outside. You are having all sense perception the same like you are having outside. And what's the difference? Only difference is there is no matter, no atoms inside. Experiences are all there. Exactly the same experiences are there that you are having outside. And if you spend time there, you found yourself an inner self that exists along with this one. This is a cover upon that inner self. But if you keep on looking out and not close your eyes, not go in, then you say, this is real. That's imaginary insight. Okay, let's start with that. This is real, that's imaginary insight. But spend time with the imaginary insight. Spend more time with the imaginary insight. What will happen? That's the power of attention. When you put time and attention inside, you will begin to know, forget where your hands, feet are, where the body is. Eventually, you'll be only aware of the imaginary self inside and not the physical self. What will happen then? Will that be more real? Because there's nothing to compare it with an outside anymore. It will be more real because you still be thinking, you still be remembering, you still have memories, and you start remembering things which have no connection with what you were remembering when you were not inside. When we're sitting in the body, we want to remember things connected with the body. When we were young, little body. What happened, what we ate yesterday in the body? But how does memory function when you are so much involved, so much engrossed by putting concentrated attention upon inside, 
you begin to remember what you experience with that. It's amazing. Please try it out and you see what you can remember. It said nothing to do with this physical body. You remember things that happened to you a hundred years ago, two hundred years ago, five hundred years ago. Your own memory, not somebody else telling you that. Where's coming from? Coming from the same mind, same self, same sense perceptions, no physical body. The memory goes way back because it's not connected with remembering after sitting in a cover and saying, I'm remembering what happened to the body. Now you're remembering what happened to your sense perceptions. It's a great thing. Easy for us to do and experiment and find out that the body is merely a cover upon a self of ours which has a longer life and pre-existed this physical body. You can do more exercises and find even more. How? How about putting attention behind the eyes of the inner self? Not these eyes. We are already moving around inside. Inside, which is moving around physically, moving around, I mean, imaginatively. We sit down somewhere, quietly, on a nice place. You can imagine anything. We can imagine sitting next to a river, a stream. I can hear the sound of the stream. I like that sound. I'm sitting next to that. I'm closing my eyes and imagining who am I inside. Same thing I did with this body, I'm doing inside. What will happen? Suddenly, your perception will change. You will find hearing, seeing, same thing. Light can be heard, sound can be seen. It look, if I tell you now, looks like a new experience. There it look like, I've always had the experience. Why would I divide it up? The inner self, you have reached your mind. You become unaware of the sense perceptions identically as you became unaware of the physical body merely by using the same method of withdrawing attention to your consciousness within. If you can do that, you discover the whole creation of destiny. You'll discover exactly how this whole world is made up outside and inside. You'll discover all the Existence anywhere existing. It's all there. It is all created from there. You have reached a point of creativity. All creation, all possible creation has come from there. Can you imagine it's so, so close to us? It's inside us. Of course, with all these tricks of the trade, that means concentrating attention, do, putting this effort to do this, does not take us any more inside. Beyond that, you have to depend on something beyond that. And what is beyond that is our own consciousness. Our own consciousness is still beyond that. With the mind which is a cover upon consciousness, you cannot cross the mind. You may try as hard as you like. You're still confining yourself more to the mind. The harder you try, the more you are involved with the mind, because the mind tries. What about consciousness? Can it also try? Have you ever thought, can the consciousness per se, or the soul, that we call soul, our life or consciousness, does it ever try anything? Might surprise you, never. Soul never tries anything. It doesn't have to. It just exists. It exists in order to create that to which it can become conscious and it creates the mind to put effort and do things. Soul doesn't have to do it. But if you can be pulled by a force within that, you can even discover consciousness per se beyond time and space. And that is where the role of a perfect living master comes in in a physical world. Because a perfect living master is nothing but our own creation of a human being whose awareness here, we have shut ours, his is open. 
created by the same power of consciousness. Perfect living master is as much part of the created universes as anything else. No different. The only difference is that we have so arranged that in case we want to go back to the same state from where this whole creation took place and practice other creations, if we want consciousness wants to have experimentation in many areas, this is just one area we tried. And to get out, we made a good method. Even at three covers beyond, with physical cover on, we should be able to create in this experience something that is connected with our consciousness beyond the mind. And we produce a human being who is conscious outside of our body as an experience with a consciousness beyond the mind. Human being appears in our, in our life when we are ready to withdraw back to that point and start something new. When he appears, he tells us, go inside. I am also inside. Encourages you to go inside. You go inside, you find, actually, he is inside. He has just looked outside. Because we never looked inside, therefore he appears outside. When we look inside, he is inside and outside. Same method, like everything else. Then we, he pulls us with his love, which is coming from beyond the mind. Thinking mind cannot create it. It's a spiritual quality of consciousness, per se. And when that love pulls, we think we are being pulled in the beginning like a guy outside. Then we say, no, he's a guy inside. Then we find, no, he's a guy way beyond our mind. Then we find it's ourself. No difference. It's our own arrangement that we have made to go back to this ultimate level from where the whole drama starts and it can be started all over again. I am sharing this information with you because such persons come into our life when we are ready to have that experience. They come by themselves by a prearrangement. Everything is prearranged. Nothing is being done now. It's being prearranged. It, it does not look like a real drama if we know that's prearranged. That's why we enjoy a movie without knowing what's going to happen next. If we know what's happening next, it destroys the surprise, the mystery of the movie. And we do not want to destroy the mystery and surprise of this life by knowing in advance what the whole program is. But you can know it. You can know it if you want to recreate another experience. Or if you want to find out what other experiences are already created and you are confining yourself to just one by putting on these covers. It's a beautiful experience. Such a person appeared in my life. Photo here. Azur Maharaj Baba Savan Singh, perfect living master who appeared in my life. And all I've shared with you is something coming from the practice of what he said. And I know all, all of you are qualified and have the same things. What he had, what he gave me, what I've experienced, all of us have the same thing. No difference. It's not that some rare people have got this ability. Not at all. We all have. The only thing is, are we really desirous of going there? Are we really desirous of finding the truth? Are we really seekers of truth? If we are seekers of truth, this thing will happen. Seeking just leads to this automatically. If we don't want to seek, show, enjoy the show as it is. Make it as real as you like. Keep going. Enjoy your birth, enjoy your death, enjoy your marriage, enjoy your children, enjoy your job, enjoy food, enjoy everything. And suffer illnesses, suffer accidents, suffer arguments, suffer disputes. Also, enjoy. It's a big, big duality existing for you to enjoy. Enjoy both. If you are the actor, you will only enjoy good things and suffer the bad ones. If you're a witness, you can enjoy both. But if you're an actor, you'll enjoy one at a time and feel high or low with the act. But if you're inside, you'll enjoy both. It's a show you're watching. So the basic elementary thing you can do is 
just to become a witness of the show going on outside, which you call your life. Thank you very much for spending time with me and listening to me. We'll have a little break for some snacks. I can't smell them, but I know. <laughs> I'm developing one sense at least. I'll come and see you about three o'clock again. I understand there's going to be a lot of snow this evening, so we'll try to finish the program a little early, and you can leave home if you are going to some distances. And uh, some people who have asked for personal time, especially those who have not seen me before, I'll see them after I finish talking for a half an hour or so at three o'clock, and then I'll see you again next month in February again. I'm very happy I get a chance to see all of you once a month. And uh, it, it, it makes me feel that I am not alone on this travel. We are all co-travelers. So many co-travelers with me. It makes me feel we are all going together to a wonderful place, which is our own self. Wonderful place contained within our own self. And it is the self the self that never disappears, the self that is here now, and we feel that is myself, even making the body the self. The same self that when we dream is moving in the dream in a different dream body, same self. We go to a higher level of awareness, same self. We go to totality of consciousness, same self. Self never changes. Everything else changes. Everything. All experiences change. All awarenesses change. Self who picks up this never changes. Consciousness never changes. The very secret from which everything is coming never changes. So if really the definition of reality should be that which never changes. If it's changing, how can it be real? If you say reality is that which never changes, the only reality is the self the ultimate self, the self that's covered and makes itself the bodies itself, but sits inside the bodies no matter how many bodies it makes, no matter how many forms it takes, it remains inside that form. And so it has to be found within any form that you have. The self is the reality and self has been called God, self has been worshipped without knowing it's inside. We have made pictures of the self in different forms outside, we worship them. But the creative power remains the same self. You can give it any name. Just because we are unaware of it, we make it God. Doesn't matter. Call him God. Call yourself God. Call the self God. And, but find out. Not only worship, find out. Find, see God. Go in. Every person who's called that self God has also said, God lives inside. Also said, this body, kingdom of God, real kingdom of God. And in every religion they have described the virtue of the body, human body, in which God can be found. God is nothing but total. Now imagine the concept of totality. If something is total, nothing is outside of it. If something is outside, it's not total. If the self is total, if it is God, everything is in God, nothing outside. If we say God is sitting somewhere, we are sitting here, can't be God. We separated ourselves already. We already made God a small piece somewhere else. Cannot be God, not the definition that we have. God is total. Everything is in God, God is in everything. We don't want to separate God from anything. Therefore, when you say total, totality does not exclude anything. And that's what we discover. When we go and discover our own total consciousness, we are not discovering something separate from what we are seeing here. This whole drama that we are seeing anywhere, at any level, is part of that totality. Some people think it's a journey to some other place. It's a journey to totality. They said, oh, won't you miss this when you go there? 
No, because this is there. Nothing has been created anywhere else except within the totality, within God, within the self. Therefore, when you reach totality of self, everything that's ever been created is all there. Not that you left something to go there. That's the last stage. Before that, it's all separate. Before that, separation continues. Their separation of everything ends. And when we say, we are all one, we are all one, these are statements. I, I, we are one, but I don't like that one. What kind of one are we? I like that more. This is not one. There you experience one. There you experience the origin and experience and creation is all one. That's where you discover and it's a discovery. That's the highest knowledge of truth. I do not know any higher truth than that within our access. Thank you very much once again. I'll see you at 3 o'clock.